Okay. Boys and girls, we're about to do a nine hour car ride to finish off this voyage. Let's do it. Well, we are in Mongolia. We just arrived after tuna fishing, spear fishing, one extreme to other. Now we are going to the mountains of Hangai and chasing for Hangai Argali and Gobi Ibex. <laughs> Make sure it's still. All right, my ammo's a little bit lighter. Apparently, you can only bring 30 rounds into the country. We had 40. <laughs> you know, <laughs> details. so good a lot of travel uh, nine hour flight I think we've been driving since about nine this morning uh, after the nine hour flight and it is now probably about eight o'clock at night so it's been a long day Where are we? We are in the middle of nowhere. We've been driving about 12 and a half hours. Just so we understand what we did, we just did that. <laughs> okay. Notice 96 miles total. Okay. So I'm saying that's at least 30 miles. Where we could have just gone from here to that point <laughs> and saved that 30. In 15 minutes, if we can't find the gap, I'm gonna start acting like a crazy person. <laughs> And I hate to say this, but as someone who's driven minivans a bunch with the kids and stuff like that, they're actually a rather practical vehicle. They and are. I, normally they are. I'd have to cut my own dick off to even say that, but. <laughs> Never any doubt. Woo. Never any doubt. a.m. and we started the car voyage at 9 a.m. and I was the schmuck that's like I'm gonna stay up till we get you know get it so I slept for like two hours he was smart because he got like nine hours of sleep already Atlanta to Miami, Miami to Istanbul, another, that's nine hours. Istanbul to Ulaanbaatar, another nine hours. And I think we did 17 hours uh, in the car on some rather rough highway and at least 100 miles and change off-road. We are checking uh, the gun zero because uh, Customs did a wonderful job of putting the gun in upside down when they checked it. Uh, so it's been bouncing on the scope for 17 hours. <laughs> Let's make sure this thing's on before we go out and start hunting. And I also like to let my gun settle in. That first shot was about a half inch low. And that's why most people would just leave that alone and be fine and just be like, hey, we're ready to hunt. But the next two then literally are touching about an inch and a half low. So they settled. That first one started settling down, settled into that you know, about 0.3, you know, it's called three centimeters. I adjusted three centimeters up and put one right through the bullseye. So, uh, zeroed out the turret, zeroed out everything. And so now all my drops will be consistent through there. But you miss that, you have to take a 500 sh yard shot and you're literally already starting at 15 centimeters off target, thinking your gun zeroed.
Well, Don is a good friend. We know each other quite a few years and we, we hunted a lot in the past. So he's a true hunter and uh, it's a great pleasure to able to hunt together and guide him. He loves this thing and I think it's such a pleasure because he's, a, he's, a great, uh, he's in great shape and he's a great shot. So mountain hunting is much more challenging than anywhere else because mountains are steep. There, there are a lot of uh, different factors. You have to know the wind, the sun, and the rain and snow, you, have, you, you shall be able to climb and judge. And when you're shooting some of the long distance, you have to know exactly where, uh, how to calculate the wind and uh, dial up and hit that game. Well, uh, hunting is uh, number one tool for conservation because nomadic people, they come graze their animals and they move to the next spot where they have the grass. In Mongolia, we have more than 80 million domestic animals. The domestic uh, animals, they compete with the wildlife, especially the sheep and ibex. So you have to understand this nomadic lifestyle. So if you give a value to the wild sheep, they will protect this animal. If we don't get these quotas, the system would not work. We are thankful to the Mongolian government and wildlife department for their efforts, and also U.S. Fish and Wildlife giving the quotas every year to hunt the species, because when they get the revenues, they can protect the wildlife and make sure this can sustain. So for future, I want more areas to be protected, and we will have more conservation in Mongolia, we will have more sheep and more ibex. We have the plan, so we have part of Khan's team and actual you know, Mongolian game scout here for all of these things. You you need some of that government support and, and understanding, make sure you're playing by all the rules. This is going back into conservation. These sheep are here uh, because of these guys and because of hunters and you know coming in and making sure to preserve that. Otherwise, with the domestic population, they'd probably be gone because you know they'd be encroaching on you know these guys' livelihoods. But this is a great way to supplement that and make sure we preserve these incredible sheep. I'm going to defer to you guys for the playing. You know the terrain. Uh, it, it's amazing how these guys can look at hundreds and hundreds of square miles and they know it like it's like you know your backyard. You're the boss. I'm just listening <laughs> and uh, hopefully being the guy behind the gun. <laughs> we are scouting here and uh, over 10 days we saw totally 24 or 5 
Rams. Wow. Just Rams. Rams. But I'm a few using you know, Rams and lots, lots. Mm -hmm. And then we choosing in a biggest one. Yeah. Then watching in my team. That's around great. Here. Find a big guy, yeah. go into stock and see what yeah, we can do. In, yeah. And that's what I think people don't understand. I mean, they, they, I saw, and I've done a lot of sheep hunting, um, you know, over the world, but especially in, you know, sort of Alaska, Canada area. I saw more rams, rams. in Mongolia on my first afternoon ever in Mongolia a couple of years ago mm -hmm. than I have in an entire, you know, through seven or eight sheep hunts, you know, in the Americas. You can't fathom the sort of the quality and the size and the and bands of 75 rams. You guys have done a phenomenal job making sure that that species goes. And like I said, I've done a lot of sheep hunting and I saw more rams in two hours on the first afternoon I ever had in Mongolia. And I'm saying, wait a second, mm. uh, it, it, it's pretty spectacular. So we're looking for that older, uh, just that old ram, uh, you know, been there, done that. He's uh, passed on his genetics and we're going to go try to find him. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. I would say this is right on target for um, how we like to operate. Get outside of your comfort zone. One thing that I've always just been kind of uninterested in is stories of hunts that were just about the hunt. You know, here I am, this is what I just shot. Let me pound my chest a little bit and show it to everybody. I've, I like the cultural story. I like the people, the food, the terrain, love the hunt. But to me, on trips like this, the hunt is always kind of the secondary theme. It's more about the adventure and the trip and who you meet and just the cool shit you get to experience along the way. No, just do who works. Big pet. Yeah. I like the pet. I'd say in terms of a field ethos trip, this is about as perfect as it gets. Perfect.